Hello and welcome to episode 119 of the Game Pit, and we're continuing our quest to bring as many games as possible to you in preview format from Essen 2018. I'm Sean, and here's Ronan. Hey everyone, welcome back again to the second of our Spiel 2018 Treasure Hunt. Very glad to have you along for this ride with us. 12 more games which we have been researching, watching videos, reading rule books, and we're going to give it a good old guess as to how good these games might be. Good old guess is exactly right, isn't it, Ronan? So we have to start with this caveat, is that we have not played these games we're just looking from afar like you. you would do yourself when you're doing your Essen research. And we're just making a good old guess, as Ronan said, about them. Don't take our words for verbatim. But uh, we may be right, we may be wrong. Never once to let inform to be attached knowingly to our opinions. <laughs> so we hope you enjoyed the last set. This set, Sean, I'm going to be honest here already. It's going to be harder to get a treasure out of me this time around. <laughs> Ronan, I was thinking the very same thing. Last time was pretty much treasure laden. It was a uh, yeah, really positive. I'm not quite as positive about the ones we've got on offer today. Yeah, I'm a little bit. We might not tweet this one out so much. We might not let the publishers know about this. <laughs> There'll be some <laughs> publishers be removed from the tweet, shall we say? <laughs> anyway, let's crack on. Let's let these games run the gauntlet. Absolutely. And as always, we are very proud members of the Dice Tower Network. Go there and to the Dice Tower itself for gaming goodness galore. If you wish to download our episodes, we're on Spotify, Podbean, Stitcher and iTunes. And of course, we do have our YouTube channel where we have our pit stop videos. So the first game we're going to be running the rule over in this episode is Gravity Superstar. For two to six players, taking 30 minutes from Sit Down, designed by Julien Alain. In Gravity Superstar, each of the players is a famous space adventurer, and they've all gathered around a planet with some funny gravity, and they're going to be racing around this planet, trying to catch the special stardust that has appeared. You set out a grid of square tiles, and the number of them is dependent on player count. And there's lots of uh, spots on there, that they're, they're grids themselves, and lots of them have got star symbols on there, and another, they're called replay symbols, and you're going to cover those with different coloured star tokens. Each of the players is going to appear through a different door, and their meeple is going to represent them on this grid, and it's going to be lying down. And the way this game works is that your meeple will always move in the direction that its feet is pointing in, but that will shift around as you do different things. Each of the players has got five action cards, and on their turn they're going to play one of them. You can always play them face down, that's a simple move, and what you'll do is... Your meeple will always start off standing on a platform, so there'll be a platform under the direction of their feet. And with a simple move, you just move left or right. And what that will let you do is to fall in that direction. And every time that you're going through any stars, you're going to collect those, and you're going to fall in the direction that your feet are pointing until you hit a platform, and that will stop you moving. If you don't want to do that simple move, you can do the actual open side of the cards, and that will do things like move two spaces left or right and then fall. Or you might be able to move up and left or right and then start falling. Or it might let you drop directly straight down to the platform you're currently standing on. Or well, the last thing those action cards will let you do is to pivot, and you'll be able to turn your meeple around either 90 or 180 degrees and then start falling from there till you hit the platform. Now the edges of this grid wrap round, so if you fall off the top, you'll come back around the bottom and left and right work the same way. Also, as you go through and collect these stars, I did say there was these replay spots on the board. When you go over those, once the stars have been collected off it, you'll get replay markers, and that will allow you to take a second action on your turn. You can only do it once each turn, but it'll allow you to carry on moving around the place. If ever you move through any other player's meeple, then you're going to eject that meeple from the game, and it'll go back to them, and they'll have to come in through a door again. When the stars run out to a certain level, there will be a few left on the board, you're then going to count up. You're going to score one point for every star you've got, one point for every replay token you haven't paid, and then you're going to get some bonuses for having pairs of different colours of stars that you've collected. Sean, Gravity Superstar, an unusual spatial puzzle. 
Yeah, when I first heard about this, before I started investigating it, kind of it reminded me of the game Hope, which was a Kickstarter release a little while ago that I picked up for Natalie. Not that I've played it or anything. Cause let's not be silly that we play games. <laughs> let's not be silly, yeah. Uh, definitely on the shelf of shame, which is quite large at this point. And yeah, that Hope had that sort of 3D grid on it, that the only way you could fall down on things. But this one... It's a lot lighter than that. I watched the demo video that was made at Gen Con by Board Game Geek, and it really made it look simple and a lot of fun, to be honest. It does look like lots of fun, and it also looks like it's constant action. Everyone's move is quite simple. They have their go, and they move along, and everyone's constantly involved in it. One of the things I'll say, though, it's going to be kind of like a skill game, and that I think that certain players are going to look at it, get how the puzzle works, and be good at it, and that may well affect your enjoyment, whether you're good at it or not, because I can see it becoming frustrating if you're just not wrapping your head around this, this movement in all the different directions, especially the wrapping around. Yeah, I think the combat or sort of take that element is going to add to that as well. You can sort of land on other players and kick them off the board and and take some of their resources that they've earned. And Yeah, it seemed to be that take that element and you just take one of their resources or one of their stars. But other than that, I just, I just think it, the art looks good. I think it's going to scale well because it's a modular board and it, it sort of ups in terms of player count, uh, the size of the board. So yeah, I think it's something that was on the edge of my radar, and you've kind of brought it firmly into the centre now, Ronan. One concern I'll give you, Sean, before we sum up, slight yeah. worry about replayability. This is the same company that brought out Magic Maze, and within that box, and especially then with expansions, they add to the complexity, and more things get added, and you're playing a different game. I've, I've got question marks around that. What, that you don't think things could be added to it to sort of... Well, they just haven't added to it currently. It's not about future expansions. It's what's in that box. Yeah, it, yeah. Is I every think, game going to be very similar? Yeah, I'm quite, quite, yeah, definitely. I think they will. I think there is a lot of scope to add things. There'll be lots of clever ideas of cards to add and boards that change things up. So I think that as a framework, you're probably not getting the replayability that you would have in something like Magic Maze, but I think it, it's a stepping stone for quite a, a long a bit of longevity for the, the design idea i think uh to be honest with you, i'm going to start off with a with a fairly easy treasure for me i am surprised i thought that 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 different movement because you always say you can't get root building and movement on the map and stuff i'm surprised at you i really want to play it i think it's going to be really fun but I think it's only going to be really fun for three or four plays, and they haven't put enough in that box to keep me coming back. So I'm going to go. It's one of our favourites. Short-term treasure, long-term <laughs> trap for uh, for gravity. None, superstar. none of that. None of that. Is it a treasure or a trap? A oh, trap. Overall, it's, whenever I say that. I know you're never going to say short-term trap, long-term treasure. Where's that going to come in? <laughs> short-term, it's going to be really far first few games. I just don't think they've put enough in the box to sustain it. Fair enough. Okay, so my next game, or my first game, is Pocket Farmer, designed by Brett J. Gilbert and Cho Lun Kao from Alley Cat Games. We are creating drugs in a pharmaceutical companies in order to make the most money is the simple premise behind this you are basically trying to create four types of drugs with a random efficacy <laughs> needed for each easy for some to say and each drug needs a certain combination of numbers to activate them now that could be two pairs a run four of the same and to do this there is a central row of numbered fragment cards to choose from so the gameplay you're going to gather these fragment cards in desired collections and perform what is called a clinical trial. And there you're going to check that the side effects of your drug, each of these fragment cards has a, an efficacy value and a side effect type and value. If the undesirable side effects are less than the number required, then great. And otherwise, you're going to get minus points. Then you're going to check that there is enough efficacy. Again, minus points if you don't make the grade. And the drug is created and you're going to get the profit minus any of those points that you lost. The game is going to end when a certain number of the profit stacks are empty based on the player count. And that, in a nutshell, is Pocket Farmer. Now, this was based on a game called Medical Frontier, Ronan. And I looked at the review of Medical Frontier. It was done by Tom Vassell a little while back. And they seem to have followed his critique 
to the letter. He wanted it streamlined and things taken away. There was like a queue in action to get things put out onto the market. They've just whipped that away and they've made it a really streamlined pocket game. I think that they've done a really nice job in certain aspects. I love the original theme. Did they change the presentation much? Does it look similar to Medical Frontier? Just the sort of some of the artwork and things like that. The front of the box is it's obviously the same artist. It's almost the same picture. So okay. some of it stayed exactly the same. I think the uh, the cards that you play in the middle are slightly different and they're easier to read. Medical Frontier had the two sided cards, so you could read the number from both sides. They've just gone gone away with that and just assumed that everyone can read a number upside down. <laughs> Well, big, big leap of faith there. Yeah. But I think the presentation is really good. I think the rule book is very thorough, slightly a little bit too thorough in certain places where they take the same rule three or four times, but I'd rather that than otherwise. I think they've For got sure. all the trappings right around this, Sean. They're presenting it well to entice people in. They are. I think the theme really does make sense. I was worried about the theme making sense because when you look at it, it's quite an abstract looking game. And I was thinking, oh, they crowbar the theme into that. But I suppose when you get down to sort of making a drug, it is going to be quite abstract. It's going to be dealing with numbers and certain quantities of things. So, yeah, I think it kind of makes sense in a funny way. Here's my problem. Go on. I can't see the game in this. I can't see where the interest is or how you've got agency. You're going to try and build these chains of numbers so that they become a drug. But the market absolutely changes from your turn (laughs) to your next turn. So you don't know one single number card that's still going to be there next time you get a go. So what are you doing? What are you planning? I'll start going for fours. Clearly, I'm going to try and get three fours. Well, any four that appears in that market, you guys are already going to hoover it up. And then I'll be left with, oh, all right, I guess I'll start trying to get fives then. <laughs> it's just co- it's completely instant. There's no forward planning is, at all. And the row of cards in the middle themselves, some people are going to get really lucky. And because obviously it's kind of like that small world thing where you have to, to get to the cards at the end of the row, you have to actually take minus points. So some people are going to be at the end of the row. Some people are going to have the first three go, boop, 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 lovely, I'll take them, happy days, I'm going to be able to make my drug. Some people are going to have to take f- loads of minus points to get to the things they want, and it's completely random. As you said, the scoring is completely random. As you, you could be just left high and dry. And the amount of minus points, it's not like I'm taking three minus points, two minus points, I'll take a minus point, I, I, there you go, I've taken six minus points, or yeah, my, my side effects give me another seven minus points. I'm not then scoring 40 for my drug. I'm scoring eight. Yeah. I've done all this to get a net gain of one. So my agency is so, so punishing in there. Yeah. That's the base game. They've added expansions in the box itself. So they come with it. Five modules you can add in. You can add them all in. And I was thinking, right, this must be it. This must be where it moves from this completely simple system into something more. But they don't change the game. All they do is just try and tack on to the absolute same basic program i suppose playing devil's advocate i suppose there's a certain amount that you can see what other players are going for and there's a certain but that makes it worse yeah i know but there's a certain point where like negative drafting of those cards in the middle is going to affect you as much as the other person is your how is it because if I take a card, let's say you're collecting fives. I say, all right, I'll take this five. The next five that I need is just as likely to come out on my turn as the sixes that I was already collecting. I don't control what comes out. So I can start anything because they're all equally as likely to come into my well, hand. No, I get it. I, get it. I, I agree with you. I was just trying to, trying to argue. <laughs> well, I'm shooting that down. Right. Trap. <laughs> they've taken the original. They've put nice things in it, but they haven't fixed the issues. Pocket farmer, trap for me, mate. One of the things I actually did like about the original was the queue, and you had to sort of uh, spend sort of resources and points or actions to move up the queue because obviously you were in a queue to get your drug out onto the market, and there was a bit of a race element in there in that the higher points were in the higher up the stack, so you want your drug to get out on the market first, which makes thematic sense because you want people to start using your drug even if it isn't as good as maybe the next drug. That was kind of something that I was a bit disappointed that came out of the game. And as Ron has said, it is, it's just an, an exercise in futility, I, I think, from afar. I was really excited about Pocket Farmer, but I have to declare it a trap. 
Yeah, it had been on my list as well. So thanks for making me read the rules. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next game we've got is The Boldest. Two to five player game taking 75 minutes coming from Pegasus Spieler, Edition Spielwiles and Stronghold Games. Designed by Sophia Wagner and if you listen to episode 114 you'd have heard us talk about her previous game, Noria. The forgotten creatures and artefacts of the Iron Valley have started to stir. And we as players are going to be vying to join expeditions to explore the forest, to trap these monsters and to collect artefacts and items. Everyone gets the same starting deck of adventurers of different classes with different strengths and powers, and they get slightly different items to each other. We're going to play over five or six days, depending on how many players we have. And we're going to be playing groups of the same class of adventurers to a planning board behind a screen on each of these days. Now, each of the days is going to be three expeditions, and we have got three slots. And we're going to take cards from our... You get access to mostly your entire deck, and you're going to decide, okay, I'm going to put four of these warriors in slot one, I'm going to put three of these cooks in slot two, and five of these hunters in slot three, or however it is that you wish to do it, your allotment, without knowing what the others are doing. Once everyone's made the allotment of their classes to these slots, everyone's going to reveal them and we're going to check the strength in each of the four classes for each of the three expeditions for each day. Whoever has created the strongest hand in each class is going to get to join each expedition and so will the second one, but obviously they'll go second after the first one, as long as you've got a certain number of players. And they have symbols on them. So if I play four warrior cards and two of them have got twos and two of them have got ones, obviously that's a strength of six. And I'm going to be choosing which of those to use. The card you leave on top of your offer is your leader and they all have powers and your powers are also going to activate when you join the expedition. But then that leader is going to join the king in his tent and come out of your deck. And that's the only way you lose cards out of your deck. So you've got a balance between using the powerful ones for their actions and keeping them to help you go on other expeditions. The forest itself is in five columns of cards and the number of rows depends on players. And those cards, like I said, are monsters, items and the artifacts. The first class to go out in each expedition will be the Warriors, and they get to take one of the bottom cards in a column as long as it is a monster. And each of those have got numbers on them, and they can be worth victory points equal to the number. Also, some of them require certain items to be able to conquer them, and you start with a couple of items, but you can get more. Because the next class to go out is the Technicians, and they also can take the bottom card of one of the columns as long as it is an item to help you kill more other monsters, or it's an artifact, which much like the monsters is going to be worth a certain number of Richard points at the end of the game. The hunters go next. Now they've got special power. They can take one creature, one item and one artifact as long as they're all in the same column but they can only take certain cards and those got a little crosshair thing on them to tell you those are the ones the hunters can take. Finally, the cooks in most of the rounds are going to allow you to take three new adventurer cards from an offer out there and they're generally better than the starting cards and they'll get added immediately into your deck for use on the next round although the cooks lose the plot in the last round there's no point in them recruiting so they just become extra warriors there are also pets in your hand and you can add those to any type to boost what you're trying to do now, if you made an offer in one of those classes and you didn't get to join the expedition, then you actually get to draw one new adventure card into your deck, thereby strengthening it. For the leader powers I mentioned, when you activate them, they're going to allow you to, for example, if you're doing a warrior, you might be able to take an adjacent artifact or item, or the other way around, the technician leader might allow you to take an adjacent monster to the item or artifact you're taking, might allow them to, uh, to take cards further up, or basically allow you to take things slightly better. Any of your cards that do go out on an expedition are taken out of the game for just for the next turn. They have to go and have a rest after their revelries and they won't be in your deck for the next time around. Once we've gone through the five or six days, we're going to count the experience points we've got on our collected artifacts and on our monsters. And whoever has collected the most of those is going to be the winner of the boldest. Sean, instantly good impressions here. Very good rule book. I think it's well presented. I think the whole thing looks quite clean and just quite streamlined, and it pleased me. I completely missed this on my first go around because I just found the, the artwork. Although when you look at it closely, it's actually quite nice, but it's just so dull. Everything's like it's pasted with a sheen of fog. It's hard to make things out on the artwork. It just and it's, it does not stand out from the crowd at all. So I'm glad that you made me look at it, Rodin, because I disagree on the art, by the way. But carry on. Okay, no, fair enough. No, fair enough. I, I didn't like it at all from afar. Once I looked closely at it, it, it was a little bit better. 
but once I saw it was from the design of Noria, a game that we didn't like, but there were elements of it that I certainly did like, it was interesting for me. But I have a few issues with it, Rona. I think the bidding, completely blind bidding, like where's where's your agency there? Where do you go for certain things and just really stack the deck in that, but you, you can't see what the other players are doing? It feels like it's an absolute vital part of the game, but I didn't find it engaging. Right. But here's the mitigation. If I, let's say I go hard on Warriors and I don't get to activate my Warriors because two other people have gone harder than me, well, all of those Warriors that they've used are out of action for the next round. I get a bonus adventurer. I'm definitely getting Warriors next turn. Yeah, but I know what my next turn is then. And that's, again, not interesting to me. I know that I'm probably going to win the Warriors race because everyone else has beaten me to it this turn. Right, but then it's going to depend which monsters are at the bottom of columns because you can only get the bottom and, and they all slide down. So then it's a case of, oh, do I actually want to win the Warriors immediately? Is that, or is it more important for me to now go technicians? I think there's more thought there than you think. I like the way they've mitigated it. And the fact that also they're going to lose their leader every time that they're successful with a class. Yes, for sure. I mean, yeah. and they're weakened, you're strengthened. I actually think they did a really good job. And I mean, the central issue around that is the fact that it's blind bidding. And any time you've got blind bidding, a central mechanism in the game is risky because yeah. luck does come into it. Blind bidding sure. is very Marmite. So mm-hmm. I think it's a vital part of this is, can you accept the central mechanism as blind bidding or is that just a huge turn off for you? Yeah, fair enough. Okay, so obviously it's not it's not my cup of tea. You're, you're more interested in it, fair enough. Now, once you've got onto the expedition itself, take the leader leaders away, sort of choosing your leaders, but that's all about the bidding process i think i think then it becomes zero so you, you're going to know what you want so i'm going from in my well, the way i look at it to a quite uninteresting blind bidding that i'm not really comfortable with to a quite uninteresting zero sum well i know exactly what i need from this row i know exactly what i need from that column it doesn't hold any enticement for me but you can't just take things the best cards require certain items so you're going to have to either have that item or set yourself up and everyone has to keep their items in front of their screen. So you can look and see that that person just cannot take that monster. So there's no point in them bidding for it. Therefore, or are they going to try and take that item that's there early with their technician and then bid high on Warriors second? So they can, I think there's information there and it's not as wide open. I'm not, yeah, I'm not saying it's completely wide open. Though. Just two phases of this game put together for me are just not exciting me they're not drawing me in and i've got no real choice clearly we're coming at this from two different angles <laughs> obviously i'd say my major concern is that the, for the deck cycling because that's how they kind of mitigate against the blind bidding that your cards will be out for a round and you'll be able to add cards in you're only playing five rounds so the deck cycling is almost mitigated within itself because you're not going round and round enough for it to have that much of an impact you have to be good immediately and you have to get going on the right foot otherwise you're going to be struggling a little i'm definitely willing to give it a go i think she's a talented designer maybe didn't like her first game but yeah for me ronan i'm going to have to say that this one's a trap i can see it being a trap for a lot of people for some of the issues you've mentioned there you're going to have to enjoy that bluffing you're going to have to accept the luck factor i don't think it's too long for the amount of luck that's in there. So I've actually gone for a treasure with the boldest. And to be honest with you, if you just described it to me without looking deeper into it, I probably wouldn't have. But the little things that I was saying back as counterpoints to Sean have just tickled me back across the treasure. <laughs> but it's definitely it's definitely a suck it and see. We're, we're going to have to... Uh, the proof will be in the eating, Sean. Well, indeed. That's your first treasure of the day. Well done. Yeah, There's not many coming either. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so before I go into my next game, I just want to uh, clarify one thing. I was going to have Roll for Adventure as my next choice upon investigating a little bit further because it was on the Dice Tower's top 10 most anticipated list as well. You just throw That's Tom not... under that bus there. Carry on. Yeah, <laughs> bro, Tom, I throw, I throw him under the bus. But, yeah, it's not coming out in English, so... If, if you're a German listener, crack on. It's going to be in German. If you speak German, then fair play. You pick it up. It looks like an interesting dice game. But it's not going to be in English, so it's not going to come out until 2019. We've heard from Matthew Dunstan, the designer, and it's going to be out by from Thames Cosmos. 
But on to the one I've actually chosen now. It is a replacement. It's Nyctophobia, designed by Catherine Stipple, and comes from Pandasaurus Games, and it plays three to five players. Nyctophobia means fear of the dark, and in this game, up to four players are going to work together to escape a maniacal killer in a dark forest. On the table, you have this 3D board. Basically, depicts a maze, and the track is formed of holes to place your playing piece. And your playing pieces are going to be a certain shape so you can recognise them. Why do you have to recognise them? Because you're completely blind to the game. You have light depriving glasses that you have to wear so you can't see anything. So you're literally feeling around this player board in the dark. The other player is the killer, is also going to be guiding you to a certain degree, is the killer trying to catch and kill the players by uh, playing cards. Now what the players are going to do, they're going to talk to each other, they're going to say, well, because they're going to hear this, the click of the killer placing their marker into the holes, and they're going to say, well, the killer's off to the north, uh, I'm to the south, where are you? Well, I think I'm to the east, <laughs> based on where you are. Okay, so we need to go to the west, because that's not where the killer is, etc. A cooperative game played out in the dark. It was designed by Catherine Stipple because she wanted to play games with her blind father. She designed this for him to play, so quite a uplifting tale for the, just the design of the game. Wow, you're setting me up to sound like a right jackass <laughs> now, aren't you? You just, you I just did that deliberately. That in, I was yeah. right down the bottom of my points. So I thought I'm going to throw it in there because yeah. I know he's not going to like it. Yeah, all right. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I just got to go for it because I've got to say what I think. It's a great story, yeah, and I hope they have a lovely time with it. But physically, it looks absolutely shocking. It just oh, it looks, looks horrible. Awful. Jesus, it looks poor. I mean, there's kind of a <laughs> philosophical question there. Does it matter if most of the players are blindfolded, What how it looks? But well, It's tactile. It's a tactile game. <laughs> oh, it's all about boy. the shapes. Yeah, so what? So they haven't got to make it as ugly as possible. <laughs> that That's an issue. Secondly, you know that thing where you move and then you're allowed to feel your orthogony adjacent to yourself with your finger just to see what's around you? Yeah. Rife for cheating. Rife. I'm just going to hit my hand down there. Just feel half the board. Oh, it was just, I was only using one finger. What are the other three doing? Nothing. Nothing. Well, as you like to say, that's a problem with the player, not the game. Yeah, but you don't have to make it that um that inviting. <laughs> okay. Good points. Or oh, oh, good point. Clearly, this is going to be incredibly atmospheric for the hunted. Because you're going to have that panicky feeling. You're not going to know what's going on. You're going to feel as you should do in good horror films of this genre. You should feel that the killer has the power. The killer has got sort of supernatural powers, supernatural awareness. And they hold all the abilities. And it's very much the hunted are under threat. And I think that feeling has got to come through when you've got that blindfold on. And you're feeling a bit helpless. And you know the hunter can see what you're doing. And you're going to feel like I'm doing the wrong thing every time here. Yeah, for sure. And there's going to be two types of uh, hunter in the game. You've got the the archetypal Jason Voorhees type character that's going to just wander around trying to bludgeon you with a meat cleaver. But you've also got a witch who who is is harder to play against, but can uh, make tricks and play spells that mess things around, uh, which basically means twist the board around so you lose <laughs> you lose the direction you're going and stuff like that. That just yeah. sounds like ridiculous. <laughs> that just sounds ridiculous I think they've got to tell you they're doing it they've got to say right okay I'm rotating the board now and then everyone's got to work out where they are in terms of the rotating I think that's the point at which I walk off and go yeah alright whatever <laughs> as much as I thought you misery. as much as I thought it would be so atmospheric for the hunted how can it be much fun for the hunter because the hunter can see everything that's going on their limitation is they're only got two cards to choose from each turn the person you're hunting is one step away all the time and it's just these two cards that stopping you just making that one step and doing the blow to take away the last hit point and that can't be fun sometimes i hate you because you, you come up with my most salient point i was literally my summary rolling was that it's going to be a treasure for the people with the glasses but a trap for the hunter because i think it's going to be quite boring you're going to have to be a sort of dungeon master but with less interest 
So you're going to have to be literally working the game for them and obviously there to facilitate the game rather than part of the game. Yeah, that sounds brilliant. Um, <laughs> seeing as you've touched on your treasure or trap, but you're going to have to give us a final verdict in a sec. Clearly, I am going to go trap. I'll play it. It's not a total trap. In fact, I quite want to play it and experience it because it's so different and it's such a good idea. But it's not really for me and mainly because it's rife for too much aimless chasing around and trying to find that car and getting frustrated and just not knowing what's going on. And then when I stumbled across that car, do I feel like it's any thing that I've done particularly well? Not really. And then when I do find it, yeah, you've got to set the alarm and then help's got to come, you've got to survive another round. It's nothing to do with me if I survive the other round. And it's nothing to do with the hunted. It's whether they can pull the right cards they need or not. And in fact, all the way through, whether I survive or not, is nothing to do. I mean, there's a bit of memorization stuff, but it's so much more to do with what cards the hunter gets that the hunter gets rather that just not for me, Sean. But I thought I thought about this one and I kind of imagine it in the halls, and it could be a proper convention game that really works in a convention because everyone's laughing and having a good time, really playing this because it's so different. Uh, it's hard to come down on one way or the other end, but I think. It's something you said earlier is going to be a short-term treasure and a long-term trap. I think that kind of rings true for this one. I think you're going to play it a couple of times and have a fantastic time because it's so different and you are going to get that real sort of nail-biting moments and quite a little bit of fear building up as, you, as the killer gets close. But I think once you've played it a few times, that, that's going to fade away. So long-term trap, I'm afraid, for Nyctophobia. Okay, now for something completely different. <laughs> This is Airship City. Three to four players, about 120 minutes from Analog Lunchbox, designed by Masaki Suga, who designed Lagerstatten. We are all airship engineers who have been tasked with moving around a floating city in the sky, and we're looking to collect resources to help build up the infrastructure of this city. The main action is carried out on this 4x4 grid of action tiles and we've got a maximum of 20 rounds to give the most back to the city to score the most points. Initially each player starts with two airships in a harbour and on their turn they're going to move each of those airships one space around this grid and whichever action tile you land on with each of them you get to take whatever action is on there. Now you can do things like the gears is one of the resources in the game so you can slide the tiles across and swap the one that falls off back over to the other side so you can manipulate the grid a bit when you're ready to move around but you are limited to where your airships are. Now some of the spaces are like the forests and the mine etc and those ones are going to allow you to collect certain resources like wood and stone and what have you. Also, if you go somewhere where there's another player, like a forest or a mine, and you collect resources, there's a piggyback bonus that they get. So being somewhere that's popular is going to help you get in some resources temporarily. You can go to the shipyard, and that's going to let you build airships. Now, those are not the airships you can move around, that's somewhere else, but those are airships that help create the city. There are three different levels of them, and each type of airship requires different materials. There are wooden ones and metal ones and fancy golden ones that tourists use. And you have to build a certain number of level one ones before you can build the level twos of the same type of airships. And when you do build them, you've got two different actions you can do with those at the time. You can donate them to the city. When you donate to the city, that triggers bonuses to certain actions. For example, if I keep donating wooden airships to the city, I will then be able to collect more wood when I go to the forest. Also, I'm going to score some victory points for having the majority in each type. So if I go down one, I probably want to carry on going and keep hold of that power. The other thing I can do is when I make an airship, I can sell it. And I get a certain amount of gold as per the current market price. And that price is going to drop. And I'm going to need that gold because I can spend 10 gold pieces to get more workers. I can get to a maximum of four airships floating around the city taking the actions for me. So that's why I might want to sell them rather than donate them. There are also utilities which are required by the city. And that's not building an airship but something else. And they take quite a lot of resources. But you can donate those resources to the city and build the utility. And that's also going to help you score points. There's a workshop. You've got a limit to the amount of resources you can hold, but you can you renovate your board. And when you renovate the board, you're able to hold more resources. You also then develop one of those 16 action tiles, which means that whenever anyone goes there, they get a gathering bonus and will gather more stuff. Also, there are contracts available in a market and you can take contracts. And again, they require certain sets of resources when you hand them in. They'll help you score points. 
and finally there's a lighthouse available in the action grid and when you go to the lighthouse that lets you move one or two rows or columns and like I say mess around a bit and change the order of the tiles to get the actions where you want them to be. The game is played in a maximum of five phases of four rounds each and there are three bonus actions you get to use in each phase and they refresh after each one. In the end, victory points are going to be for having airships donated to the city, having added to the utilities, having fulfilled contracts and for having the majority in having done certain things and added to certain areas of the city. Sean, Airship City, a slightly different theme, but very much a two hour resource gathering and utilizing Euro. You've got to hope for some meat and some crunch in there if you're going to spend two hours. What are your thoughts? I was kind of drawn in by the, the artwork and the, the theming. Did you like the artwork, did you? It was one of those. I, I wasn't really sure whether I liked it or not, but I've decided I do. So there. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very unusual, but I, quite endearing. Like the, the little trees and the way, just, just the way it was, it was done. It was quite endearing. I am exactly the same. In fact, I was sitting doing the notes going, I don't know if I like the artwork or not, but I, I think endearing is the perfect word. Well done. Thank you. Okay, so I was drawn in by, obviously, the looks and the theming of it. And then I started looking into it, and I started getting a little bit excited because, obviously, you've got the economy built in there. You've got the choices whether to, where you're going to sell things or donate things, and there seems to be a lot of choices there. And it all stems from that grid where you're going to pick up your resources and do various things. Now, the more I looked at that grid, the more I thought, you know what, that grid isn't as interesting as I thought it was going to be. And although you can, you can mess around with the grid and if you go on the the same tile as other players, things happen. But the base of it, you're moving to do something, you move to do something. And then everything sort of filters back to that grid. You unlock things to give you more resources. That means you're still gathering them from that grid. And that grid I'm worried about. I'm worried about the contents of the grid and the fact that it does get much more exciting than take two wood or three wood or four wood. Exactly, exactly. So as much as the grid might move around, to be honest, by the time you've got four airships out there, I can't see that anyone moving the grid is going to make that much of a difference. In fact, I can see there being a lot of back and forth in the grid movement, whereby people are trying to move something out of the way and you're just going, no, I'll just move it straight back in because it was exactly where I wanted it to be. And by the time you've got that many things, I mean, because you, you're building up your economy as you go along, you're going to get stronger, you're going to get more powerful, you can get more actions. There is a sense of progress, but the progress doesn't really go anywhere. It doesn't. It, it go well, it does. It goes back to the grid. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. You go, you go off the grid, you do something, and now you're back on the grid. And at the beginning, yeah, you're looking to see where your optimum moves are and try to sort of make sure that things are in a certain order so you can get to them quickly. But as you said, by the end, it, you know exactly where everything is. You don't really care because you've got a massive fleet and it's just a chore that you have to do to go and do something that's quite mundane itself in the just oh, should i sell it should i donate it yeah i'm getting that person you've gone out with who's pretty and quirky and quite fun <laughs> and then you realize after a while but there's just not that much going on behind the ice it's just you know, have you got anything interesting original or any opinions do you have anything for yourself to say and oh, i'm not convinced airship city does sean <laughs> thoughts to be honest, Ryan, my f- I'm very disappointed. I had high hopes for Airship City, but it's it's a trap, and it's it became a fairly obvious trap the more I looked into it. Yeah, I'm going trap for Airship City as well. It lured me in with the theme and the presentation, and then really let me down because it's just a bog standard trademark Sean Rice Euro, <laughs> where you're just collecting some resources and hand them in and claim resources again and handing them in again and you're just doing the same thing for two hours and, and that's not good enough I'm afraid not in this year's Essen field where more interesting things are being done so Airship City we started off floating high Sean but we've come down to ground with a crash we have okay so a very different theme going in here and it's we're going to use the word steam with this game are we oh okay a very different game <laughs> shall we say <laughs> so uh, yeah it's vol foston or vol foston it's designed by anthony proietti and coming from zoch verlag 
and three to eight players. It is a dexterity stroke party game where players are basically trying to grab these big sticks or what have you <laughs> in the middle of the table and they're going to do this by being guided by dice rolls. So what happens in so the various different colour dice and they all do something, they make you do something or they guide you in different ways. And you're going to decide what ones you want in the game. And then the dice are going to be rolled and you're going to grab a post or a stick and then trying to, as closely as possible, match the requirements set out for you by the dice. So what are the dice? Well, you've got the white dice, which is basically what post. So there's different size posts in there. The orange is how you're going to grab it. So are you going to grab it left-handed, right-handed, with the backs of both hands? You've got the blue dice, which is going to make you move in some fashion, whether you have to twirl around or clap or what have you. The light blue is going to make you make a noise of some sort. And the green, you have to interact with the other players. Points are going to be scored by seeing how well you did in following the instructions set out by said dice. Roland, you are, I would say, our resident party game stroke physical dexterity type thing enthusiast. Wow. How did you find this? That doesn't say much for us because I'm not that enthusiastic about it. <laughs> <laughs> this is Jungle Speed meets Ghost Blitz in that you're racing to go something from the middle, but you have to do a bit of thinking first and a bit of like, hold on, highest number, plus doing that, plus cooking like a chicken. Do you know what this is? This is Broken Fingers in a Box. Oh, man, literally, 100%. People's hands are going to be going in there. Given there's up to eight players, eight people <laughs> firing in hands at the same time. Let me let me yeah. tell you a story, everyone. There was a like an arcade machine about maybe not quite 20 years ago that was golf, and there was a tracker ball, and you had to pull it back with your swing, and then the faster you pushed it straight forward, <laughs> the, the further you went. Sean used to get a little bit excited playing it. How many times did you split your fingers open by whizzing that oh. ball to everyone and hitting the screen in front of it? Given, given that I'd be drunk at the time, quite a few. <laughs> he literally <laughs> splitting his fingers open. He wanted to win this golf game so much. Imagine playing this with you. You have your big old ham hocks coming in, grabbing six sticks at once, and my tiny little porkies getting squeezed in the middle. It says one of the things on the roof. I saw it. I know what you're going to yeah, say. Don't, you can't grab it. Have it. Well, what if you both grab it at the same time? Yeah, you can't grab it too violently or don't get too excited. Or... Yeah. What, the speed game? <laughs> what made you choose this? <laughs> I just thought it was different. It was also on a, on a few people's lists that, uh, that I've talked to about Essen, what they're excited about. So I thought, you know what? Something different for me. I'm not usually, usually the dexterity person. Uh, let's bring it in, see what Ronan thinks. No, you're more the agility person. They're, they're subtly different. <laughs> um, I mean, I said Jungle Speed meets Ghost Blitz. They've then thrown dancing eggs in the, in the mix with they the really action dice. Yeah. Like, you've got to so go up and run around your chair before you grab a stick. Or I think we've got to tap each other on the chin. How's that going to go? Tap me on the chin after a few beers. <laughs> That's my favourite bit. I want to tap you right on the chin. <laughs> Good luck, son. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... But can you imagine, like, again, eight people around a table let's, let's say it's not the biggest table they're all kind of mushed in a little bit let's everyone run around your chair oh man I'll be fine because everyone's just going to bounce <laughs> off the people who bounce off aren't going to be great should we talk about the time the kendo black belt broke my nose and dancing eggs as well <laughs> all kinds of stupid <laughs> stories to go along you, should I sum up on Volk Fuston go on yeah there's not much to this one at all treasure because wow. for what it is I think it's actually quite a good idea. And the fact there's not just one target, there's six of them, that exactly is like Ghost Blitz, and you're trying to work out, and the fact that what you're trying to work out is different, because you can get good at certain games, but in this one it's highest number, plus cook cook like a chicken, plus I've got to catch it with the back of my fingers, and then the lots of the dice swap round what another dice says. So now I'm doing it with my pinky and ring finger off my hand I don't usually use, but that can... So all those things, I think is going to slow it down enough that it's maybe not complete mayhem. You have to be, just beware what it is. Be very aware what it is. But for what it is, I think it looks very funny. And there is the odd time where I would like to crack this out and give it a game. So I'm going treasure. 
I think it certainly has merit. I think it's going to be silly, stupid fun. But is it again something that you're going to have a lot of fun playing once or twice and then it's just going to get a little bit, mm, am I going to play that over some of those other games? I don't know. But I think I'm on the fence with it in terms of is it a great game and what's going to teeter me onto the side of trap is it's just not my type of game. But if, if it is your type of game, I, I would probably urge you to give it a go. And that is a Volfosten. And that's the end of our first half. And we'll catch you in the second half with more Essen traps or treasures. Sean, how about some pepper and carrot? I like both of those. I will have some pepper and some carrot. Marvellous. Let's do this. It's a one to four player game taking 30 minutes from Loyalist Games designed by Guillermo H. Nunez. Peppa is a young witch and she and Carrot, her cat, are off to a potion making contest where they have to mix up three recipes quicker than anyone else. There are three levels of pepper and carrot. You're going to make a grid of ingredients of either 12, 15 or 18 tiles for your own, which are all mixed up face down. Then you turn them all face up into this grid in front of yourself. There are going to be three of each ingredient you've included with four for a level one game up through five and six for the other levels. There will then be sets of main recipes which will be laid out in lines. There'll be the same ingredients that are on your tiles in front of you and the lines will be between three and seven ingredients long. Again, depending upon what level you have played. The player's tiles all have connectors on them which go off in two or three different directions. And what you're trying to do is connect the ingredients which are in the line in the recipes on the central board on your own board so that you can make a coherent line through and nothing branches off and nothing goes wrong and once you've done that for all three recipes you're going to have won the game now the way you do that is there are action tiles and you're going to see the one that's available for this round plus the next two are going to be laid out for you and they'll proceed along when you do the round the next two slide up and another one gets played out so you can always see ahead what's going to be done so it's going to be simultaneous play on all of these actions and what are they one one of the three types is going to allow you to rotate your tiles so you can get those connectors into positions you want them to. One of them is going to allow you to swap two tiles around, either vertically or horizontally. And one of them is going to allow you to push a whole column or row and slide the tile off the other end and pull it back where it's been pushed from. Players also have one of each of those actions throughout the whole game they're bonus actions they've got three bonus actions so you can supersede whatever the main action is and say no i don't want to rotate this turn i need to swap and again like i say you get one of those for each game simple as that you've got to get your tiles in the right pattern with the right connections in order to win the game of pepper and carrot sean a quick brain burner spatial puzzle how do you fancy it not in the slightest i ain't even beaten about the bush what have you made me look at it looks like a fruit machine I hadn't made the fruit machine connection. <laughs> I had to say, I didn't expect you to be quite so strident out of the blocks. Oh, I hate the look of it. It just looks so really? boring and dull. You know what? It's clean. I know it's got clean lines. It's got good iconography. <sighs> I like the cutesy presentation. I like the pepper and carrot story. I was like, oh, it's nice. We're with little witches fighting. No. That, that ends there, and then you go on to play a fruit machine down your local pub. <laughs> this, is, this is so unexpected, I've been thrown off my track here. <laughs> I mean, I've got some points to make, but I'm not sure I can really bounce off you in a natural flow. This is a, a high level of aggression for a very inoffensive 30-minute game. I mean, okay, it does seem to be very solitaire. You're basically doing your own puzzle and what the other people are doing doesn't really affect you because it's not like you have to be first to a potion. you just got to be first to do all three. I think the connections are, because the connections are kind of a brownie colour. I can see myself getting quite frustrated thinking I had things lined up and they weren't, whereas you might actually enjoy that kind of thing, Ronan. That would just irritate me because my standpoint is already that I'm quite irritated by the lack of any sort of theme it, there doesn't seem enough actions to make it interesting now whether that's just streamlined and and it makes the game work better well i'll leave it that for others because i won't be playing it some men just want to see the world burn <laughs> i think you, I, i'm just going to pretend i'm flying solo here just, <laughs> you want to try and make some actual points about the trap game. <laughs> 
<laughs> shut up shut your trap uh, I did have concerns about the luck factor with the initial setup in that if you turn your tiles over and suddenly you're like oh I've almost done these that's game over isn't it so that that was my biggest concern with it really mitigated by the fact it's only a 30 minute game and it's aimed at children and families so I don't know where this vitriol is coming from I'm going to let Sean come in with his what's bound to be surprising verdict I think I've made myself clear raw trap in the background we call it that the background are we okay good trap. guess what I went for treasure you are wrong and you're so wrong. Quite charming. I like the spatial aspect. I like the fact that you could plan three moves ahead. I like the fact that you had three different things to work on at once. You had to make the prioritization off. Okay, rotating doesn't help me on this one. But in that second recipe, rotating will help me over there and I can start setting that up. I like the fact that you get scales. So you're playing quite a simple game initially with just 12 tiles and very simple recipes and you can build it up from there and get better at it. And I thought actually... Where I thought you might be interested is you always say there's lots of games for younger kids. There's games for them when kids can start getting into gamely aspects, but there's not many games in that mid level for mid kids, as I've turned them from the top of my head. And I thought this is where this would sit, and that Pepper and Carrot was quite a nice little family game. That where's, I treasured. The, where's the interest for, for a child? Like, where, you're, you're, twisting, you're twisting symbols. Yeah, but a, a, a child, we're talking about a child who's eight or nine or ten. They love puzzles like that. They love the fact that their brain's working in a slightly different way. And the fact that they can plan ahead, but it's not too hardcore. And especially saying it's a witch contest, you're making potions. That will draw in children who don't want to be a dwarf fighting an orc. (laughs) Okay, so you're obviously uh, a more experienced parent than than myself because I've got got a six-year-old and a a zero-year-old. So yeah, maybe down the road, maybe maybe it will come into my reckoning. But for the, for the time being, Ronan, if you say to me, "Do you want carrot and pepper?" You better be feeding me. Well, I, I have to feed you to calm you down at this stage. <laughs> <laughs> We're definitely not getting in a peeing contest about parenting either. <laughs> Sean's a very good dad. Okay, <laughs> let's just move on. Yeah, but just, just less experienced than you. It's fine. <laughs> My next game is Small Islands from Alexis Allard, and it comes from Mushroom Games and The Wood Games, playing one to four players. This is a tile placement game, and we are daring explorers discovering an archipelago where the islands are full of natural resources and temples from an ancient civilization. So each player is looking to gain the most prestige for discovering these islands and, and basically ripping the resources from them. So on the table you have got uh, tiles, it's a tile layer, and on the tiles are islands, temples and resources stacked in one pile called the navigation deck, and each player has also got one ship tile each. You also have objectives in this game, and you're also able to lay tokens with the resources that are already on the island just to bump that up. Last thing you've got in your sort of player area is buildings in your colour. And why have you got that? So on your turn, you're going to place a tile from the three available at the top of the table. And you're going to follow the usual rules. Obviously, land must match land and sea must match sea, etc. You have the option to place one of those tokens onto the island that you've just placed. And when the navigation stack is empty, you can, if possible, place your ship tile. And this is going to trigger the scoring. So I mentioned the objectives cards. Now these have two sides. One side tells you where you can place your buildings. Uh, Basically, it tells you what has to be on that island to allow you to place your buildings. And then the other side is how many points you get. So it might say you need one temple and three orchids to be able to place on that island. And then it will tell you how many points you're going to get for each temple on the island. And then you've got how many points you're going to get for each orchid on the island, etc. The game ends when all the players have placed their boat or when the tiles run out. Or again, when no legal move is possible. Very simply there, Ronan, that is Small Islands, another island-based tile layer. Does it stand out from the crowd? i tell you why it's going to stand out from the crowd. Because people are going to print out that rule book, and then they're going to hoss it at the nearest wall window (laughs) or fireplace. There's a video that makes it a a lot more sense of it, let's say. 
here's the biggest frustration, and it's a real sting in the tail, a real a real kick in the conies. I struggled through that rule book, and he's the layout is an absolute disaster, <laughs> and the structuring of the rules is rabidly difficult for a very simple game. Then on the very last page, in a box nary bigger than a postage stamp, is this little flow chart that you look at it and goes, that's the game. Why wasn't that on page one? <laughs> if you just put that on page one, all the pain I've just gone through. I, if this wasn't a treasure hunt, I'd have read two pages of that and gone, I don't care what the game's like, I'm not interested. I had the video lined up on my big telly on YouTube and I had the rule book opened on my laptop in front of me. I started reading the rule book, flicked on the video, stopped reading the rule book and watched the video and I learned the whole game. Well, I can, I can see that. And I don't know why they've got 12 pages and they're hiding the most useful thing on the back page. So that in itself was incredibly irritating. Okay, I'm going to start. I've got two kind of linked ones. So I've tried to start with. Start with. I'll start with this one. The variety in the missions or the objectives, depending on which mode you're playing, it seemed lacking. It did in terms of what they were. But the fact that they were there, Onan... It means that you are working towards something. A lot of tile layers, you're kind of you're working on the hoof. You're like, okay, right, I've got this. Well, how do I make the best use of that? This one, you've got that choice up the top, and you're working towards something. Obviously, if you've got a mission that says you need loads of orchids on an island, obviously you're going to want to be getting as many orchids into one area. At least you, you kind of have that information, and you're driving towards something, which is slightly different to a lot of them. You've led me... To my next point, like a <laughs> buffalo to a radish field. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> Do they like radishes? Yes, okay. very much. The problem then is that the objective cards are hidden. So every time that I'm playing down a, a token, like I'm covering up whatever with an orchid to create a screen opportunity for myself, I can't tell whether I'm helping or hindering the other players. And I may just be creating their screen opportunities for them and handing them more points than I'm handing myself. And in general, I find that quite frustrating in games. Yeah, it, it definitely a flaw that I think there has to be an empty space for your house. So I'm not sure how sort of regular the empty spaces come up. So I'm, I'm kind of guessing worst case scenario, there's one empty space you've put together the, the majority of an island that's going to score you loads of points and somebody nicks that empty space. You're not going to be happy. No. Well, I'm not happy in general, mate. It, it put me off on the wrong foot with the bad rule book. There was just little irritations in there and faff that I didn't feel like I was getting enough back for it to really be worth my time, for it to stand out. Small Islands gets a trap as far as I'm concerned. I told you it was going to be a tough episode. <laughs> yeah, for me, it, it kind of looked very similar to sort of other types of games. I play, we played Ilios recently, and uh, a game like Ilios actually was a lot stronger than this one. There was elements of it, even just the triggering the scoring with the boat placement, it just didn't seem to... There was something hovering there that made me think it's not, not going to work and it's not going to be And that, that can happen as soon as, like, six tiles in. Yeah, right? yeah, as soon as that navigation pile's empty, which is six tiles, then, yeah, you can you can trigger that, so... I'm not sure enough of this game is going to work to make it interesting. Now, I did like the driving towards something, but for me, I'm going to have to say it's a trap, Ronan. So it's a double trap. You're driving towards something, and I'm driving away from it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to Solenia, a one to four player, 45 minute game from Pearl Games and Sebastian Dujardin, the designer of Trois and Deus. There is a planet in which everything has gone out of whack and it's not moving correctly within its solar system. And the northern hemisphere is locked in darkness and the southern hemisphere is in permanent daylight. As the players, we are on an airship which is travelling around this planet and we're going to be freighting the resources twixt the light and the dark side, giving them what they require in order to help them moving on, as have our ancestors since time immemorial. The board itself is made out of five strips and they have got day and night size to them and there's one dusk or dawn tile which starts off in the middle. Also in the middle is an airship. Now on these five strips there's five spaces on each and the airship controls that middle space of the 25 spaces all the time. Each player has got a deck of 16 cards and on their cards there's zero, one or two and also a special action on the bottom of them. 
On your turn, you're going to play one card, and your card must be played to the board. It must be either adjacent to the airship or next to one of your own cards, which you have played previously, or you can pay some resources in order to jump away and give yourself further opportunities. You're going to play these cards onto a space and there will be either a resource space or a city in either the dark or light side of the planet. On a resource place, you're going to take wood, stone, wheat or water according to the card value of the card you've played. And they've got groovy little portholes in the card so you can see what you're taking. When you go to a city, you're looking to match a delivery tile and there'll be a selection of those available to choose from. You're going to match them with resources you've collected and there's a limit to how many of those you can hold. And when you do that, it's going to score you some gold stars and you're going to take the tile and it will be day or night according to where you've gone to deliver and you put it onto your own board. Anytime anyone plays a zero card, the ship is going to advance one strip. When it does that, the back row now, all the cards that are left on there are going to activate with those powers which are on the cards. And they're going to give you bonuses and extra resources and let you do little, just little things. And then that strip's going to get picked up, flipped over. So if it's a night strip, it will become a day strip and vice versa. The dusk and dawn one will always stay dusk or dawn and go to the front. So we're going to be gradually moving into day originally and back past dusk then back into night. Once everyone has played all 16 of their cards, it's going to be the end of the game. Everyone is going to score points for deliveries they've made and also then for pairs of deliveries they have make, make sure that they're doing both sides of the resources equally and also any leftover resources they have. There are some harder modes in which you can store fewer resources and the pairs of deliveries that you've made score slightly differently, but they're all very similar in the game of Selenia. Sean, I love the theme. I love that shipboard with the movement and the fact it goes into day and it goes into night. I think it's a fantastic idea. It's got a fantastic four page rule book. Overall, a very good front foot presentation for Selenia. It looks lovely, Ronan. It looks really nice. I saw sort of the uh, prototype. It was under a different name. It was like Sun and Moon or something like that, it used to be called. And they changed the name. They changed up the design. And it does look, it looks really nice uh, on the board. Now, my concern going into it, Ronan, so you've got the movable board. So you obviously things turn into, into day, basically. And they, they move to the front and the and night goes into day. My initial worry was that would be almost a smoke screen as an interesting thing to draw people in. Did it go any deeper than that for you? No. <laughs> well, we're not we're not hiding things to the audience, <laughs> one, are we? <laughs> I'm just gonna tear that curtain down and then get it all out there, dance naked around the place screaming, why have you made a basic Euro when you had such a really good idea? <laughs> we just had to go at Airship City for having an interesting theme and then just making it into a bog standard, collect some bloody cubes and put them somewhere and score some VP in the most standard way. This is such a good idea. This whole idea of the board moving and changing. Then have it change. Do you know how much this changes? You collect wood and stone from the dark side. That's what they want delivered to the day cities. And collect wheat and water from the day side. And that's what they want delivered to the night cities. That's just different colours of cubes. There was such an opportunity here to do something more exciting. You've done so much good with it. You've come up with this innovation. Why? Why? It reminds me of Noria. Again, going back to that. Why tack on so boring thing? What a such a good idea. You just, it's upsetting. The the movable board was is interesting, but I didn't feel like the, the area was big enough. I felt like there wasn't that much choice of things to do. And obviously that tax down to you're only picking up four resources, two on day, two on night. So why it doesn't need to be any bigger. So they're condensing this into quite a bog standard euro have more strips have things that unveil that are unusual have the one-off appearance of the mystical crystal mountain and that we can go to and whoever gets there first gets something special and then we can yeah oh, come on man i'm no game designer i'm rubbish here i'm rubbish at theme even but you can come up with better things than just the color of the cubes changes yeah you have like, like an, an event deck so sometimes so that you can maybe see two two or three cards on so sometimes obviously the cards that are on the the end strip that goes to the front strip score have, have something that where something else happens to them if you if you time it wrong 
so something bad can happen because it's obvious if you want to score points leave them on the bottom like there's two choices go up to the top and get free lots of resources because you can revisit them or go to the back and get points when we were talking about the two Feld games, we were saying he gets you to do standard things, but he puts obstacles in your way and it changes the way you have to think about things. In this, in Airship City, there's no obstacle. Okay, people can beat you with cards to a certain space. So what? I'll go to the other space that gives me wood or I'll get the other resource. It really doesn't make any difference. Ugh, just disappointed in this, Sean. I don't think we're hiding our cards here. Go on tell us yeah so I, I do actually want to try this one Ronan, just to see to be honest to it deserves places. a try right because it looks so good yeah it looks beautiful I, I want to see it up close and i suppose part of that is actually getting hold of it and playing it and i'm, I'm willing to be turned but at the moment i think it's a firm trap i'm going trap i'm saying it's fine but it's just fine unfortunately nothing gameplay wise to stand out so it's another trap in this episode this episode is brutal mate we did not plan it this way <laughs> so my next game and i apologize in advance there's a lot to this one and i struggle to to condense it for you it's robin hood and the merry men it's even even the amount of designers is long in this game so you've got ivana Kristevsky. Volkan Kristevsky, Maya Matovska, Martin Poole, and Tony Toshevsky. And it's from Final Frontier Games, one to five players. So it's all about Robin Hood, as the title would suggest. And in this game, Prince John has forced Maid Marian into a wedding. Now she sends for help to Robin, who's her true love, and he vows to save her. But the merry men are a bit. Mm, not too sure about this. They think it's a very dangerous mission just for Robin to to go and find his true love. So to get them to help, he's decided to challenge them. He bets them that none of them can protect Nottingham as well as he can. And if they do show him that they can or better, he will bestow his mantle of the leadership of the Merry Men and the Outlaws onto them. So players are going to take on the role of Robin or one of the famous Merry Men and to play this worker placement game. And it's got a semi-co-op mechanism, which I know drives fear into the very heart of Ronan. Players are going to have a character and a player board, and they're going to have a, a certain amount of action cards. The central board has a number of worker placement areas, and there's quite a few on there. Gameplay goes like so. So you have the Merry Men phase, where you go to play a card to place a worker. Now, each placement area has three hideouts or placement spaces, and you can have guards that are going to block some of those for you. What they are is gathering resources. You've got the, your, your basic resources, and these are there, there to build traps and barricades. Barricades are very important, and I'll talk about them right at the end. You ha can gather weapons. You're going to need to fight the guards and ambush carriages. You have distraction tokens in this game. That's another worker placement space. And this is to re-roll dice, rescue prisoners, we'll come to that again, and sneak past the sheriff who's going to be moving around the board. You can rob the rich. You're going to basically roll dice for rewards, but you're going to risk getting put in prison. So that's where those distraction tokens would come in in that respect. You can construct those traps that you've gained the resources for and the barricades. And building these is going to give you rewards that are going to be revealed on your player boards. And you can also send an envoy to King Richard to help him in his crusades uh, for points. Then you move on to the hero phase. So everything there is basically gathering things, getting things into your hand. And the hero phase is when it all sort of comes into action. And you're going to, in the hero phase, gain weapon dice. Now, these are going to obviously help you fight later on. You get to activate the Sheriff of Nottingham, and he has a stack of cards that activates him, and that's going to move him around and deploy guards into certain spaces. Guards are placed in an area where traps are captured, so that's why we're making traps. Then you get to move your hero figure. So everything else has been workers, so the non-known ones of the Merry Men. This is your hero figure. He or she is going to rob carriages, uh, going to fight guards at the sites to, to push them back and so that they don't over, take over the sites. They're going to break out prisoners and even compete in archery competitions. The win and lose conditions are as such. Players are going to lose if a certain amount of carriages... Now, we haven't talked about carriages... 
those Sheriff of Nottingham cards also put carriages that are going to take the tax money that's ripped from the, the poor to the castle of Nottingham. And what we're going to try and do is stop those happening. That's why we're putting up barricades. But if a certain amount of those carriages make the castle and deliver that tax money and leave one road without any money, we all lose the game. If a guards completely surround a worker placement area then we all lose the game. That's why Robin's out there and whoever else is out there fighting these guards to, to drive them back. Now, if after five rounds, none of the above has happened, then players are basically going to add up their prestige points and one player is going to be the winner. Sorry about the long introduction there, Ronan. There is a lot going on in this game. Yeah, and in only five rounds... And that's where I'm kind of, I kind of wish there were more rounds because there's so many things to do. And but you're doing a lot in those rounds. Those rounds are quite lengthy. Like this is a good two and a half hour game. I know what you're saying, but to me, a lot of the interest was a lot of the decision making. Because when you put out your merry men, little meeples, your workers, those things are quite basic, right? You're mm. collecting some resources and you're paying them to do stuff. We've been over this quite a lot this episode. <laughs> it was some of the actual hero actions that I was more interested in, where you counter what's going on on the board, or you try and rescue people, or you go to an archery contest. It was that when I was going, oh, this, this actually sounds all right. Or the fact that you can donate your dude off to the Crusades and you, you lose them, but it's quite expensive to do, but it scores a lot of points. And I'm thinking, if you decide to do that, you're going to have to decide to do that from round one. I kind of wished that maybe, or to me, it seemed like the Sheriff of Nottingham threat was really quite high, and I wish that they'd maybe cut a little bit out of the game, made each round go quicker, reduced the threat of the Sheriff of Nottingham, and given us more time to explore the story, because for the amount of effort and thought that goes in, it kind of feels like I'm really rushed in what I have to do. Um, I, I didn't really feel that. Well, I did feel that the King Richard out on his crusades action was... It almost felt like a, an additional thing that didn't really need to be there. That one, I'm, I'm right alongside. I, th I just... No, I, I like it. I like that actual thing because it's, it's like a long-term thing to plan for. Mm. It just feels difficult to do in just five rounds. But a lot of that is, is paying resources to go and do it. But I think you do have... You have the ability to get, obviously, more workers into your hand. You have bonuses for revealing traps or when you build traps and bonuses when you build barricades. All right, so, but okay, let's, let's go for the traps, all right? There's, so, lots, but there's lots of things you are gathering in each I know, round. but let's... Like, for example, the traps. So there are four places in each area. There are only two free at the beginning of the game. And they can fill up really quickly. And you have to have your traps in place before they start filling up. And it just seems like it's so like, oh, you've got to do this right now because we just don't have much time. Maybe it's me. I just feel like I wish it was a bit more strategic and a bit more lengthened in terms of rounds and streamlined in terms of actual play. How did you feel about the actual sort of cooperative side of it? Because obviously you have to kind of work together. You, you can't let the guards overtake or the, too many of those carriages with the tax money get to the castle. So you do have to kind of think together as a team, which I thought was very thematic. Did you think it worked at all? Horrible. Horrible like it is in 95% of those games. <laughs> look, look, I, mate, I, disagree. I'm trying to win. I disagree on this. No, time. no, I'm trying to win. All right, this is, whatever the theme is, I'm trying to win the game. So I'm before you in turn order, and that thing needs doing. If I do it, you get to score more points. So guess what? I'm not doing it. Now you have to do it. No, no, but I don't think it works like that. I think you get more points for the if you put the right barricade down, etc. Because I watched a, a playthrough of this um, through Tantrum House, and I watched their full playthrough a little while back, actually, because I was quite interested in this game for a long time. And person who ended up winning won by so 90 odd points to 60 because they built more barricades and they scored a lot of points from building barricades that's where the caveat is in terms of normally i'm right with you i don't like semi cars but the fact that you do score your points for placing them in the right places regardless if it helps everyone else or not it never works it shouldn't be the loss condition have it as a punishment have it as whoever's done the least loses a certain number of points 
And I think the other thing really was maybe one or two or three too many times I saw that go do an action, roll dice, get one success. Or oh, next time you'll do it, roll two dice, get one success. If you want to push your luck, roll one dice. And get, you know, it was the same mechanism. And thematically, I wanted it to be different. So going to rescue prisoners is exactly the same mechanically as going to the archery contest, which is exactly the same mechanically as some other thing. I can't remember what it is. <laughs> no, fair enough. And I didn't see the point of really pushing your luck because you don't really... It's, it's, again, a lottery, but you don't really get generally a lot for pushing your luck so because uh, all the tiles go back into the bag so everyone's got the same chance of getting a not very good <laughs> resource rather than something amazing i tell you what i really really feel about this is that they desperately needed a game developer and some of those ideas were which are just repetition could have been cut away some of the play length could have been reduced down without losing any of the heart of what is a good idea and a good game. And the bloat could have been taking it down to either a 90-minute game at its current weight or extended it a bit to make it a real epic story to go back up to that play length, but have the players have more agency and more strategy and more time to actually do things and control rather than running around fighting fires all the time. The semi-co-op thing, all right, fine. Some people might like it. I, I don't hear a lot of love for it. I'm going to have to be, but there you go. So I really want to like it. I just think that they needed more development of the game. And then it could have been something very, very good. And as it is now, it's just not quite for me. Trap. So for me, I think it's a beautiful game. The artwork is done by the Miko, who did the artwork on the North Sea trilogy. So I was already a fan of his, and I think it looks absolutely stunning. I love the distinct phases. I really like that, that you're, you're sort of gathering, you're trying to basically arm your hero to go into battle and do all the heroic things and make sure that, that he or she has got everything they need to set them up in, in that next phase. Love it. Yeah, I'm not a fan of semi-co-op, but this one, given that you get points for doing things that are part of the semi-co-op aspect of the game then that kind of mitigates against that a little bit i'm still i'm still a bit worried about it i didn't back it on kickstarter because i was a little bit worried but having looked at it more closely here i'm actually really excited the rule book's very good i found it really easy to pick out things and for me it's a definite treasure and probably my biggest treasure of the episode and that's robin hood and his merry men I'm worried that the sheriff's gold is glittering in your eyes, <laughs> blinding you to the rotten heart behind. Just a little, though. not very Get on bad. with it. Okay, all right. My last game of the episode is Magna Storm. Two to four players, 90 minutes long, from Furland Spieler and Mandala, designed by Baldrick and Friends. And here's a curiosity. They designed one game before. It was Power Struggle, which came out in 2009. So I, I don't know what they've been doing for nine years, but here we have Magna Storm. Set in the future, by the way, Earth has discovered another planet. There's a huge magnetic storm which is raging on this planet, swirling round and round. You are going to represent one of the four major governments of the Earth. The Earth is basically split into four governments nowadays, and they're all very happy with each other. And we're heading off to this planet in order to exploit the resources we can find there, and also research the remnants of an ancient culture. There's a board of drip since the planet is split into six sectors. At any one time, the storm is going to cover half of the board. And it's represented by a hexagon in the middle, which turns around. And the half of the hexagon, which is red, is going to say that area's got the storm in it. And it's going to affect what you can do with it. Each player on the board is going to start with one scout runner. We all start in the same space. And via that scout runner, which is like a little rover, we're going to be spreading it, sending it out around the planet and allowing it to spread our presence. There is an action board. That action board has got five columns in it and many rows and it's split into two halves. Now with the columns, the first column is linked to being first player and the other four are linked to certain commanders which are going to give you bonuses if you're ever able to take control of them. Generally on your turn, you're going to take a worker from this top board, from one of the columns. It's going to be a player colour one. It's going to have to be your own player colour if you've got any of your own colour left. Or a neutral one, and yellow just happens to be the neutral colour. You're going to take that and you're going to assign it to a position on the lower board. 
if you place it an assignment at any place on the lower board, they're going to have a linked amount of credits you can gain. Now, credits are cubes. They come in the player colours and they also come in yellow, the neutral colour. And you're going to take these and many of the things you wish to do are going to cost you credits in the course of the game, including when you place that worker from the top board to the bottom board. Instead of gaining credits, you can pay credits and that's going to allow you to move your scout runner around the place. When you move your scout runner to a new area, you drop off what's called a turtle lab and everyone starts with 10 off them. And the first couple you drop off on the board and they're going to represent your presence on the board are free, those first couple. But the other ones, again, you're going to have to pay in credit. So you're going to have to be running your economy a little. There are ways of moving around the board. You don't have, just have to do go to the adjacent place. There are also transmitter spots. If you run through an empty transmitter spot with your scout runner, you can build a transmitter. It costs you some credits, but it causes cause you two reputation points, which is what we're all trying to do. And that allows you to zip around the board a bit faster. But wherever you are, the color of the area in which you place that space turtle, there's another board. And it's got four research tracks on there and they're linked to the color of the spaces on the board and they show or represent your research into this ancient culture. And your dobber is going to move up one step on that research board to show that you've put your space turtle lab there and it's investigating what's going on. Now, when you move up that lab spaces, you might get a little bonus in terms of credits or something else. And also, when you go on a worker space, there are certain bonuses you can get on there, including moving up the research track and getting credits again. So where you choose to take the worker from and where you put it is all quite important. Why is it important where you choose the worker from? Because, remember I said that there's these four commanders at the top of the action board, as well as the first player marker. To take the first player marker or to take control of one of those four commanders, you look at how many workers are currently in their column and that number is going to be decreasing all the time as people take them to gain credits or to take actions. And when you can pay a credit that matches each of the workers underneath that commander, you can take control off them. If the commander happens to currently be controlled by another player, I must play an extra credit of their color to do this. When I take the commander, I'm going to gain some reputation points. If I take it off someone else, they're going to lose reputation point, but they're going to have gained more by getting hold of the commander in the first place. It's always a good thing to do. And that commander is also then going to boost some of my actions during the game. There are eight commanders that come in the game. You're going to play with four. So there's all different ones. And trust me, I'm not going to go through all eight of them. Once all the crew have been taken from the top board into the bottom board, whether it be by gaining commanders or by using them for actions, that's going to be the end of the round. We're then going to do some upkeep. Now, your turtle labs on the board are going to give you credit income depending on how many you've got in each of the three sectors that don't have the storm in them. Also, whoever's got a majority of turtle labs in each of those areas is going to score one reputation point again. While I was talking about the commanders on the action labs, I never mentioned the commanders that are linked to the research track as well. And now, whoever is highest up in each of the four research tracks is going to gain com control of those commanders, and they are going to boost your actions as you're trying to do things around the board. And the same as with the operations commanders, these research commanders, you're going to gain reputation points for gaining them. And if you take them off someone else, they might lose a small amount of reputation points. You're going to swap the action panels around so the bottom one becomes the top one and then you're going to rotate the storm around as well sweeping into one of the areas we've been placing turtle labs but leaving another area open for us to go into one of the major ways you're going to be scoring these reputation points is that there are objectives set out at the beginning of the game two based on research and two based on your presence on the board and they're going to require you either to give up turtle labs you have on the board to score points the first person to get in each objective is going to score more points than the people who subsequently follow one but it's still the main way you're going to score points and the research ones require you to move down on research tracks a certain amount and again there's lots of different types of objectives but they all go along those two basic things the game is going to finish either on the exact round that a player hits the reputation point target, which is player number dependent, or after four rounds of the game. And whoever has got the highest reputation at that stage is going to be the winner of Magnus Storm. Sean, that was a hefty old rule book to get through. This is no light filler. It really isn't. <laughs> Rules blindness is, is setting in. This was a tough, tough one to read through, Ronan. All the little uh, stories at the top, and I struggled. <laughs> I struggled to get through it. Now, what I, what I have gleaned from it is 
I'm really interested in that sort of bidding for the commanders and the special powers that you get and the fact that you're not just stuck with them for the whole game. People can take them off you and you can move, you can get other commanders. So I like that and I like the aspect of that. What then made it really intriguing to me is that every time I don't take a commander, I have to take a worker in some way and I'm making those commanders cheaper every time yeah, and for sure, yeah. looking at like, oh, which column do I take from? Then becomes a real set. Every move matters. It only might only matter a little bit, but every single move does matter. And every time you're going down somewhere and choosing where to put the worker down, it affects how expensive the commanders are going to be next turn. And if you're planning to get a commander, you want to make them like, so you might start filling up the column number two and everyone will go, well, clearly you're going to try and take column number two because you're making it more expensive for next time. And that sort of thing really interests me. Yeah, absolutely. So the more I dove into this rule book, Ronan, I kind of started thinking, is this actually a fairly simple collection of mechanisms? So you've got your resource gathering, your area control, your bidding, your individual player power, just surrounded by a mountain of faff. I'm not saying it's a, it's a bad game, but is it a lot simpler than it appears on the surface? I certainly think it's a lot simpler than it appears on the surface. I 100% think it's one of those games that's going to be much easier to learn by playing than it is yeah, learning yeah. from the rule book. When I first looked at the rule book, which was a while ago, it, it was a bit overwhelming. I didn't really give it a proper look through. When I started reading the rule book this time, the first few pages were quite dense. The six and a half pages of setup and theme, but yeah, mostly set up. Yes, yes. That is really intimidating. And that really makes you think, wow, there's so much here. I don't think there is much there. And one of the things that really helped me is the fact that if you stick to that theme and it's two-pronged, you're going on this planet to either spread out and gather resources or you're going there to research and learn as much as you can about the culture. That's the two ways you score points. That's the two things you're going to do. You're putting turtle labs on the planet or you're moving your research tracks. All the ways in which you do that might be different, but you can explore that at your own pace and you can just concentrate on one or two of them at a time realizing that that's all you're doing yeah for sure another question here for you Ronan. go on it's a turtle lab a turtle lab is a lab that looks like a turtle yeah they're literally turtles i'm like oh, that's just a name for something and and i looked at the pieces on the rule book and they're actually turtles isn't that they, kind they've got like the head and legs and everything <laughs> of course <It's> turtle. <gasps> what else would they be <laughs> turtles they're not even turtles though because there's no water so there must be tortoises why are they not tortoise labs <laughs> i don't know they haven't even got flippers they've got claws they haven't got flippers you're right they've got legs yeah so they're clearly tortoise labs <laughs> that's just horrific I don't, I don't, you've lost me mate i don't really know what's going on there to be honest with you yeah. um <laughs> I think, that, I think that hindered my reading of the rule book every time it mentioned them i thought why you just lost on it why is it not a koala lab? Did you get stuck on page five and you didn't get any further? <laughs> just pointing <laughs> just and crying. Go past it. But, crying. but, but, okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to try and pull this back to some gameplay. I love that when you score those objectives, the main scoring is going to weaken you. You're going to have to remove your presence from the board, which means you're not going to get the area majority. You're not going to get the credit income. You're going to weaken yourself in the research tracks to take those objectives, meaning you're not going to get the research commanders, which again means you don't get the bonuses. I like that because it's a sacrifice to score and you have to choose when to score. But if you wait too long and someone else nabs in ahead of you, they're going to score a point more than you. And it does feel like a game in which every point might count because like the, the target points are in the 20s, no matter what your, your player count is. You're not scoring hundreds of points yeah it kind of does all boil down to me how those mechanisms all gel together and sort of how sort of one feeds into another yeah because they're very interlocked aren't they everything yeah. interlocked together yeah so okay well i'm going to sum up Rowan. i think i love the story i love the theming behind it not so sure about the actual artwork itself i think the board looks a bit messy but hopefully functional but definitely some of those mechanisms contained within are very interesting to me i really want to see how they play out and and if they sort of form a cohesive unit moving forward so for me it's a treasure 100 percent treasure it just clicked together to me as i read that rule book 
and the fact that it's not 500 steps to achieve something it is one thing does something clear which clearly progresses me towards what i'm trying to do to win the game oh that's the type of euro i like the fact that it's euro and efficiency but hugely interactive the fact that you can attack each other and take the commanders and cost you points but it's not direct attacking there's no attacking on the board although trying to beat people maybe to certain spaces with your turtle labs trying to get your scout rover going along you can use other people's transmitters to move but it's going to cost you so trying to get your transmitters in the right places the storm sweeping round, so it keeps everything that's going on the board dynamic there's a load of things i absolutely love in this and to be honest with you if i had read magna storm more carefully it would have been in my top 10 most anticipated i, I just fully on board for this one magna storm's coming home with me sean big treasure very good okay last up today is a game called aussie land and it's from helen mayorga and pablo castillo and from abba games playing two to six players it's very heavily themed around the wizard of oz no it's not and isn't it? It's not heavily themed around anything, mate. But carry on with your rules. Oh, no, 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 no. The, okay, this, this which is going to be my first point. <laughs> it's, it looks very heavily themed around the Wizard of Oz with, with literally Dorothy and the Tin Man, etc. skipping along the yellow brick road. Don't, don't let me disturb you further. Carry on with your rules explanation. <laughs> and... In the game, the land of Oz is shifting, and you've got to help the Scarecrow, Tin Man, Lion and Dorothy make a land where seas and deserts live together with poppy fields and forests and the yellow brick road. The good witch will help while the wicked witch hinders. So it's a tile placement game, and there are two game modes within this. So the tiles themselves are hexagons, and they have each of the aforementioned six landscapes upon them. The first game is called Land of Oz and what you do is you place the tiles in your own sort of land, your own tableau. The placement rules are one side must, must match one on the adjacent tile so there could be others and they don't have to match. Some tiles have a character on them and if you manage to enclose an area with that character you're going to get that character token which gives you a special power to help you or hinder others. Scoring in this game is for every tile you have in your tableau, for every character tokens you have, and for having the largest area of each of the landscapes. The second game is called Escape from Oz, and it plays very similar to the first one, but it's a central area that you're building, and players are going to start with 8 to 10 tiles, and once all the character tokens are taken, the game will end when one player has the most characters and has no tiles in their hand. So, Ronan, the game is definitely themed on The Wizard of Oz. When you open that box, the game is no longer themed on The Wizard of Oz. This was clearly the last game we had to research. And I just it's horrific. <laughs> the game, it looks horrific. It's like, it looks like prototypes someone's printed off on their home computer. I it's think awful. it's more themed on Aussie bloke, Sean. <laughs> What you got there, mate? <laughs> it looks rubbish. These mantis has got really mad here. He's about to kick this geezer in the face. I love Aussie Blake. Anyway. <laughs> um, Oz theme. Nope. Looks. Nope. Nope. <laughs> two, two games in there or one game? Uh, one game with two end conditions, I'd imagine. <laughs> okay. One game in there or not really any games in there. I wouldn't go as far to say it's not a game. The Which first game one is want? not a game. It's just shocking. You know what? They would have got away with it if they paid any attention to The Wizard of Oz once the box was opened and any attention to artistic values or principles, any attention to the crafting of the game. You know what? They might have got away with it as a kid's game. The fact Even with just... the rule book in broken English. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> this is the worst game that we've looked at in terms of impressions for a treasure hunt in oh my word. the longest just, but... time. It was one of those ones I, I was kind of scanned. I was like, oh, a Wizard of Oz game. That might be interesting. I'll put that on the list to look at. 
And <laughs> I just wanted to share my disappointment <laughs> when I and just a component look. So we start with okay, what does it look like? Okay, does it was it play? You read the blurb on Board Game Geek. Oh, this is this. Oh, there's the theme behind it and roughly what it is. And then you look at the pictures and you're like, I was like, what? <laughs> what is that? What's the whole character thing about? We're like, you get this guy, get Dorothy, play a tile. Get get the lion, choose another character. There's nothing to do with those characters. We're talking about. It's just not even vaguely related. <laughs> it could be character A and character B. It's just what? Oh, why did they? I guess. Look, do you know why they went for the Oz theme? Because he just like you will look at it because it's got an Oz theme on it. <laughs> you proved them correct. <laughs> well, I looked at it and now I'm deriding it on a podcast. So. Not that anyone listens to it. Well, but possibly still. it backfired. I I just. <laughs> Mate, what do you want me to say about this? There's just absolutely nothing there. Okay, so I think if you are going to look at this game, just scrap the theme. Completely scrap it. It's, but even then, this. Even, no, but even it's just then, colour matching. It's just not even clever colour matching. On, yeah, you judge it on it is. Like, don't, don't get pulled in by the Wizard of Oz theme. There isn't one. It's, it's just colour matching, and it's trying to get groups of colour. But so, to what end? It's just boring. Like, I either have got blue or I haven't got blue. It just doesn't make any sense. And you can't exactly make big areas because they're hexagons. And are, there's are you one... talking about the thematic C colour? Is that what it is, is it? So the blue is C, yes. Yeah. Is, is red fields of poppies? That'd be it. Is yellow the yellow brick road? Yeah, that'd be it. Is green the emerald sea? No, it's forests. Well, well they missed a the trick there. They missed a the trick. <laughs> they have missed a the trick. <laughs> I, look, I don't really want to come on here and really be mean about games that designers have designed and publishers have put effort into. I just don't feel like effort has been put into this. So I don't feel so bad chuckling about it because you're deriding it because it is deridable. Trap. Yeah, yeah, for me, 100% trap. Yeah, it just, I was just so disappointed that in, the, in the lack of theme. I'll forgive a lot of things if you just continue with the theme throughout and make it look pretty. And they've done, done none of those things. So you've upset me now. So it's a definite trap. And that was Aussie Land, which concludes our list for today. And we'll catch you in the outro. So, Sean, 12 more. Not the finest batch. We won't be laying that one down to mature for 20 years. No, no. But there, there was one I'm really excited about. I know you weren't, but there was uh, Robin Hood I'm really excited about. And they did uh, Rise to Nobilities, which is another game that's kind of on my radar. I am more than happy to play it. While I have my reservations, as we always say, mate, this is from not having played it. So yeah. we, I can't say for sure. But apart from about Aussie Land, I can say that for sure. But <laughs> I can't say about that. And obviously, I am very excited about Magnus Storm as well. So there are at least a couple of gems that we're, we're pushing your way out of this lot. We're going to be back next episode with 12 more games to treasure hunt we've had a quick look over them here sean in the break while we were saving our files and a little more hopeful do you think yeah i think a little more hopeful for sure it's going to be interesting right thank you very much sean thank you ronan thank you everyone for joining us and we'll catch you next time and as always, we are very proud members of the Dice Tower Network. Go there and to the Dice Tower itself for gaming goodness galore. If you wish to download the episodes, we're on Podbean, Stitcher, iTunes and Spotify. And we do have our YouTube channel where we have our pit stop videos and convention coverage. We are on social media. We have an Instagram account, we have a Facebook account and we're on Twitter at Game Pit Podcast. If you wish to contact us, email us at thegamepitpodcast at gmail.com or pop along to our Board Game Geek Guild where we can be found chatting a load of nonsense as usual. Thank you very much everyone for listening and we'll catch you next time. Music by E. Aaron.
boy, 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 bo